section fifteen of a budget of christmas tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by christy luther the chimes by charles dickens fourth quarter some new remembrance of the ghostly figures in the bells some faint impression of the ringing of the chimes some giddy consciousness of having seen the swarm of phantoms reproduced and reproduced until the recollection of them lost itself in the confusion of their numbers some hurried knowledge how conveyed to him he knew not that more years had passed and trotty with the spirit of the child attending him stood looking on at mortal company fat company rosy-cheeked company comfortable company they were but two but they were red enough for ten they sat before a bright fire with a small low table between them and unless the fragrance of hot tea and muffins lingered longer in that room than in most others the table had seen service very lately but all the cups and saucers being clean and in their proper places in the corner cupboard and the brass toasting fork hanging in its usual nook and spreading its four idle fingers out as if it wanted to be measured for a glove there remained no other visible tokens of the meal just finished than such as purred and washed their whiskers in the person of the basking cat and glistened in the gracious not to say the greasy faces of her patrons this cosy couple married evidently had made a fair division of the fire between them and sat looking at the glowing sparks that dropped into the grate now nodding off into a doze now waking up again when some hot fragment larger than the rest came rattling down as if the fire were coming with it it was in no danger of sudden extinction however for it gleamed not only in the little room and on the panes of window-glass in the door, and on the curtain half drawn across them, but in the little shop beyond. A little shop, quite crammed and choked with the abundance of its stock, a perfectly voracious little shop, with a maw as accommodating and full as any shark's. Cheese, butter, firewood, soap, pickles, matches, bacon, table-beer, peg-tops, sweetmeats, boys' kites, bird-seed, cold ham birch brooms hearthstones salt vinegar blacking red herrings stationery lard mushroom ketchup stay laces loaves of bread shuttlecocks eggs and slate pencils everything was fish that came to the net of this greedy little shop and all articles were in its net glancing at such of these items as were visible in the shining of the blaze and the less cheerful radiance of two smoky lamps which burnt but dimly in the shop itself as though its plethora sat heavy on their lungs and glancing then at one of the two faces by the parlour fire trotty had small difficulty in recognising in the stout old lady mrs chickenstalker always inclined to corpulency even in the days when he had known her as established in the general line and having a small balance against him in her books the features of her companion were less easy to him the great broad chin with creases in it large enough to hide a finger in the astonished eyes that seemed to expostulate with themselves for sinking deeper and deeper into the yielding fat of the soft face the nose afflicted with that disordered action of its functions which is generally termed the snuffles the short thick throat and labouring chest with other beauties of the like description though calculated to impress the memory trotty could at first allot to nobody he had ever known and yet he had some recollection of them too at length in mrs chickenstalker's partner in the general line and in the crooked and eccentric line of life he recognised the former porter of sir joseph bowley an apoplectic innocent who had connected himself in trotty's mind with mrs chickenstalker years ago by giving him admission to the mansion 
where he had confessed his obligations to that lady, and drawn on his unlucky head such grave reproach. Trotty had little interest in a change like this, after the changes he had seen, but association is very strong sometimes, and he looked involuntarily behind the parlour door, where the accounts of credit customers were usually kept in chalk. There was no record of his name. Some names were there, but they were strange to him, and infinitely fewer than of old, from which he argued that the porter was an advocate of ready-money transactions, and on coming into the business had looked pretty sharp after the chicken-stalker defaulters. So desolate was Trotty, and so mournful for the youth and promise of his blighted child, that it was a sorrow to him even to have no place in Mrs. Chickenstalker's ledger. "'What sort of a night is it, Anne?' inquired the former porter of Sir Joseph Bowley, stretching out his legs before the fire, and rubbing as much of them as his short arms could reach, with an air that added, "'Here I am, if it's bad, and I don't want to go out if it's good.' "'Odd weather, indeed,' returned his wife, shaking her head. "'Aye, aye. Years,' said Mr. Tugby, "'are like Christians in that respect. Some of them die hard, some of them die easy. This one hasn't many days to run, and is making a fight for it. I like him all the better. There's a customer, my love.' Attentive to the rattling door, Mrs. Tugby had already risen. "'Now then,' said that lady, passing out into the little shop, "'What's wanted? Oh, I beg your pardon, sir, I'm sure. I didn't think it was you.' She made this apology to a gentleman in black, who, with his wristbands tucked up, and his hat cocked loungingly on one side, and his hand in his pocket, sat down astride on the table-beer barrel, and nodded in return. "'This is a bad business upstairs, Mrs. Tugby,' said the gentleman. "'The man can't live.' "'Not the back attic can't!' cried Tugby, coming out into the shop to join the conference. "'The back attic, Mr. Tugby,' said the gentleman, "'is coming downstairs fast, and will be below the basement very soon.' Looking by turns at Tugby and his wife, he sounded the barrel with his knuckles for the depth of beer, and, having found it, played a tune upon the empty part. "'The back attic, Mr. Tugby,' said the gentleman, Tugby, having stood in silent consternation for some time, is going. "'Then,' said Tugby, turning to his wife, "'he must go, you know, before he's gone.' "'I don't think you can move him,' said the gentleman, shaking his head. "'I wouldn't take the responsibility of saying it could be done myself. "'You had better leave him where he is. He can't live long.' "'It's the only subject,' said Tugby, bringing the butter-scale down upon the counter with a crash by weighing his fist on it, that we've ever had a word upon, she and me, and look what it comes to. He's going to die here after all, going to die upon the premises, going to die in our house. And where should he have died, Tugby? cried his wife. In the workhouse, he returned. What a workhouse is made for? Not for that said Mrs. Tugby, with great energy. "'Not for that! Neither did I marry you for that! Don't think it, Tugby! I won't have it! I won't allow it! I'd be separated first and never see your face again! When my widow's name stood over that door, as it did for many, many years, the house being known as Mrs. Chickenstalker's far and wide, and never known but to its honest credit and its good report, when my widow's name stood over that door, Tugby, I knew him as a handsome, steady, manly, independent youth. I knew her as the sweetest-looking, sweetest-tempered girl I ever saw. And I knew her father, poor old creature. He fell down from the steeple, walking in his sleep, and killed himself. For the simplest, hardest-working, childest-hearted man that ever drew breath of life. And when I turn them out of house and home, may angels turn me out of heaven, as they wouldn't serve me right. Her old face, which had been a plump and dimpled one before the changes which had come to pass, 
seemed to shine out of her as she said these words, and when she dried her eyes, and shook her head and her handkerchief at Tugby, with an expression of firmness which it was quite clear was not to be easily resisted, Trotty said, "'Bless her! Bless her!' Then he listened, with a panting heart for what should follow, knowing nothing yet but that they spoke of Meg. The gentleman upon the table-beer cask, who appeared to be some authorized medical attendant upon the poor, was far too well accustomed, evidently, to little differences of opinion between man and wife, to interpose any remark in this instance. He sat softly whistling and turning little drops of beer out of the tap upon the ground, until there was a perfect calm. When he raised his head and said to Mrs. Tugby, late chicken-stalker, "'There's something interesting about the woman, even now. How did she come to marry him?' "'Why, that,' said Mrs. Tugby, taking a seat near him, "'is not the least cruel part of her story, sir. You see, they kept company, she and Richard, many years ago, when they were a young and beautiful couple. Everything was settled, and they were to have been married on New Year's Day. But, somehow, Richard got into his head, for what a gentleman told him, that he might do better, and that he'd soon repent it, and that she wasn't good enough for him, and that a young man of spirit had no business to be married. And the gentleman frightened her, and made her melancholy, and timid of his deserting her, and of her children coming to the gallows, and of it being wicked to be man and wife, and a good deal more of it. And, in short, they lingered and lingered, and their trust in one another was broken, and so at last was the match. But the fault was his. She would have married him, sir, joyfully. Oh, I've seen her heart swell many time afterwards, when he passed her in a proud and careless way, Never did a woman grieve more truly for a man than she for Richard when he first went wrong. Oh, he went wrong, did he? said the gentleman, pulling out the vent peg of the table beer and trying to peep down into the barrel through the hole. Well, sir, I don't know that he rightly understood himself, you see. I think his mind was troubled by their having broke with one another, and that but for being ashamed before the gentleman, and perhaps for being uncertain, too, how she might take it, he'd have gone through any suffering or trial to have had Meg's promise and Meg's hand again. That's my belief. He never said so, more's a pity. He took to drinking, idling, bad companions, all the fine resources that would be so much better for him than the home which he might have had. He lost his looks, his character, his health, his strength, his fringe, his work, everything. He didn't lose everything, Mrs. Tugby, returned the gentleman, because he gained a wife. I want to know how he gained her. Oh, I'm coming to it, sir, in a moment. This went on for years and years, he sinking lower and lower, she enduring, poor thing, miseries enough to wear her life away. At last he was so cast down, and cast out, that no one would employ or notice him, and doors were shut upon him, go where he would, applying from place to place and door to door, and coming for the hundredth time to one gentleman, who had often and often tried him. He was a good workman to the very end. That gentleman, who knew his history, said, "'I believe you are incorrigible, and there's only one person in the world who has a chance of reclaiming you.' Ask me to trust you no more until she tries to do it. Something like that, in his anger and vexation. Ah, said the gentleman. Well? Well, sir, he went to her, and kneeled to her, said it was so, said it ever had been so, and made a prayer to her to save him. And she... Don't distress yourself, Mrs. Tugby. She came to me that night to ask me about living here. What he was once to me, she said, is buried in a grave, side by side, with what I was to him. But I have thought of this, and I will make a trial, in the hope of saving him, for the love of the light-hearted girl, you remember her, who was to have been married on a New Year's Day, and for her love of her Richard. And he said 
he had come to her from Lillian, and Lillian had trusted to him, and she never could forget that. So they were married. When they came home here, and I saw them, I hope that such prophecies as parted them, when they were young, may not often fulfil themselves, as they did in this case, or I wouldn't be the makers of them for a mine of gold. The gentleman got off the cask and stretched himself, observing, I suppose he used her ill as soon as they were married. Oh, I don't think he ever did that, said Mrs. Tugby, shaking her head and wiping her eyes. He went on better, for a short time. But his habits were too old and strong to be got rid of. He soon fell back a little, and was falling back fast, when his illness came so strong upon him. Oh, I think he's always felt for her. I am sure he has. Oh, I've seen him in his crying fits and tremblings, try to kiss her hand. And oh, I've heard him call her Meg, and say it was her nineteenth birthday. There has been lying now these weeks and months. Between him and her baby, she's not been able to do her old work. And by not being able to be regular, she's lost it, even if she could have done it. How they have lived, I hardly know. I know, muttered Tugby, looking at the till, and round the shop, and at his wife, and rolling his head with immense intelligence. He was interrupted by a cry, a sound of lamentation, from the upper story of the house. The gentleman moved hurriedly to the door. My friend, he said, looking back, you needn't discuss whether he shall be removed or not. He has spared you that trouble, I believe. Saying so, he ran upstairs, followed by Mrs. Tugby, while Mr. Tugby panted and grumbled after them at leisure, being rendered more than commonly short-winded by the weight of the till, in which there had been an inconvenient quantity of copper. Trotty, with the child beside him, floated up the staircase like mere air. "'Follow her, follow her, follow her,' he heard the ghostly voices of the bells repeat their words as he ascended. "'Learn it from the creature dearest to your heart.' It was over, it was over, and this was she, her father's pride and joy, this haggard, wretched woman weeping by the bed, if it deserved that name, and pressing to her breast— and hanging down her head upon an infant? Who can tell how spare, how sickly, how poor an infant? Who can tell how dear? Thank God! cried Trotty, holding up his folded hands. Oh, God be thanked! She loves her child! Again Trotty heard the voices saying, Follow her. He turned toward his guide and saw it rising from him, passing through the air. Follow her, it said, and vanished. He hovered round her, sat down at her feet, looked up into her face for one trace of her old self, listened for one note of her old pleasant voice. He flitted round the child so wan, so prematurely old, so dreadful in its gravity, so plaintive in its feeble, mournful, miserable wail. He almost worshipped it. He clung to it as her only safeguard, as the last unbroken link that bound her to endurance. He set his father's hope and trust on the frail baby, watched her every look upon it as she held it in her arms, and cried a thousand times, She loves it! God be thanked she loves it! He saw the woman tend her in the night, return to her when her grudging husband was asleep and all was still, encourage her, shed tears with her, set nourishment before her. He saw the day come and the night again, the day, the night, the time go by, the house of death relieved of death, the room left to herself and to the child. He heard it moan and cry. He saw it harass her and tire her out and when she slumbered in exhaustion, drag her back to consciousness, and hold her with its tiny hands upon the rack. But she was constant to it, 
gentle with it, patient with it. Patient was its loving mother in her inmost heart and soul, and had its being knitted up with hers as when she carried it unborn. All this time she was in want, languishing away in dire and pining want. With the baby in her arms she wandered here and there in quest of occupation, and with its thin face lying in her lap and looking up in hers, did any work for any wretched sum. A day and night of labour for as many farthings as there were figures on the dial. If she had quarrelled with it, if she had neglected it, if she had looked upon it with a moment's hate, if, in the frenzy of an instant, she had struck it. No. His comfort was. She loved it always. She told no one of her extremity, and wandered abroad in the day lest she should be questioned by her only friend, for any help she received from her hands occasioned fresh disputes between the good woman and her husband, and it was new bitterness to be the daily cause of strife and discord where she owed so much. She loved it still. She loved it more and more. But a change fell upon the aspect of her love. One night she was singing faintly to it in its sleep and walking to and fro to hush it, when her door was softly opened and a man looked in. "'For the last time,' he said. "'William Fern. "'For the last time.' He listened like a man pursued, and spoke in whispers. "'Margaret, my race is nearly run. I couldn't finish it without a parting word with you, without one grateful word.' "'What have you done?' she asked, regarding him with terror. He looked at her, but gave no answer. After a short silence he made a gesture with his hand, as if he set her question by, as if he brushed it aside and said, "'It's long ago now, Margaret, but that night is as fresh in my memory as ever t'was. We little thought then,' he added, looking round, "'that we should ever meet like this. "'Your child, Margaret, let me have it in my arms. Let me hold your child.' He put his hat upon the floor and took it, and he trembled as he took it, from head to foot. "'Is it a girl?' Yes. He put his hand before its little face. See how weak I'm grown, Margaret. When I want the courage to look at it, let her be a moment. I won't hurt her. It's long ago, but what's her name? Margaret, she answered quickly. I'm glad of that, he said. I'm glad of that. He seemed to breathe more freely, and after pausing for an instant, took away his hand and looked upon the infant's face, but covered it again immediately. Margaret, he said, and gave her back the child. It's Lillian's. Lillian's? I held the same face in my arms when Lillian's mother died and left her. When Lillian's mother died and left her? she repeated wildly. How shrill you speak. Why do you fix your eyes upon me so? Margaret. She sunk down in a chair and pressed the infant to her breast and wept over it. Sometimes she released it from her embrace to look anxiously in its face, then strained it to her bosom again. At those times, when she gazed upon it, then it was that something fierce and terrible began to mingle with her love. Then it was that her old father quailed. Follow her, was sounded through the house. Learn it from the creature dearest to your heart. Margaret, said Fern, bending over her and kissing her upon the brow, I thank you for the last time. Good night. Goodbye. Put your hand in mine, and tell me you'll forget me from this hour, and try to think the end of me was here. She called to him, but he was gone. She sat down stupefied, until her infant roused her to a sense of hunger, cold, and darkness. She paced the room with it the live-long night, hushing it and soothing it, 
she said, at intervals, like Lillian, when her mother died and left her. Why was her step so quick, and her eyes so wild, her love so fierce and terrible, whenever she repeated those words? But it is love, said Trotty. It is love. She'll never cease to love it, my poor Meg. She dressed the child the next morning with unusual care. Ah, vain expenditure of care upon such squalid robes! And once more tried to find some means of life. It was the last day of the old year. She tried till night, and never broke her fast. She tried in vain. She mingled with an abject crowd, who tarried in the snow until it pleased some officer appointed to dispense the public charity, the lawful charity, not that once preached upon a mount, to call them in and question them, and say to this one, go to such a place, and to that one, come next week, to make a football of another wretch, and pass him here and there, from hand to hand, from house to house, until he wearied and lay down to die, or started up and robbed, and so became a higher sort of criminal, whose claims allowed of no delay. Here, too, she failed. She loved her child, and wished to have it lying on her breast, and that was quite enough. It was night, a bleak, dark, cutting night, when, pressing the child close to her for warmth, she arrived outside the house she called her home. She was so faint and giddy that she saw no one standing in the doorway until she was close upon it and about to enter. Then she recognized the master of the house, who had so disposed himself, with his person it was not difficult, as to fill up the whole entry. "'Oh,' he said softly, "'you have come back.' She looked at the child and shook her head. "'Don't you think you have lived here long enough without paying rent? Don't you think that, without any money, you've been a pretty constant customer at this shop now?' said Mr. Tugby. She repeated the same mute appeal. "'Suppose you try and deal somewhere else,' he said. "'And suppose you provide yourself with another lodging. Come, don't you think you could manage it?' She said, in a low voice, that it was very late. Tomorrow. "'Now I see what you want,' said Tugby. "'And what you mean. You know there are two parties in this house about you, and you delight in setting them by the ears. I don't want any quarrels.' I'm speaking softly, to avoid a quarrel. But if you don't go away, I'll speak out loud, and you shall cause words loud enough to please you. But you shan't come in. That I am determined. She put her hair back with her hand, and looked in a sudden manner at the sky and the dark, lowering distance. This is the last night of an old year and I won't carry ill blood and quarrelings and disturbances into a new one, to please you nor anybody else, said Tugby, who was quite a retail friend and father. I wonder you aren't ashamed of yourself to carry such practices into a new year. If you haven't any business in the world but to be always giving way and always making disturbances between man and wife, you'd be better out of it. Go along with you. Follow her to desperation. Again the old man heard the voices. Looking up, he saw the figures hovering in the air and pointing where she went down the dark street. She loves it, he exclaimed in agonized entreaty for her. Chimes, she loves it still. Follow her. The shadows swept upon the track she had taken like a cloud. Oh, for something to awaken her, for any sight or sound or scent, to call up tender recollections in a brain on fire, for any gentle image of the past to rise up before her. "'I was her father! I was her father!' 
cried the old man, stretching out his hands to the dark shadows flying on above. "'Have mercy on her, and on me! Where does she go? Turn her back! I was her father!' But they only pointed to her as she hurried on. "'To desperation! Learn it from the creature dearest to your heart!' A hundred voices echoed it. The air was made of breath expended in those words. He seemed to take them in at every gasp he drew. They were everywhere, and not to be escaped. And still she hurried on, the same light in her eyes. All at once she stopped. "'Now, turn her back!' exclaimed the old man, tearing his white hair. "'My child! Meg! Turn her back!' Great father, turn her back! In her own scanty shawl, she wrapped the baby warm. With her fevered hands, she smoothed its limbs, composed its face, arranged its mean attire. In her wasted arms, she folded it, as though she never would resign it more. And with her dry lips, kissed it in a final pang and last long agony of love putting its tiny hand upon her neck and holding it there, within her dress, next to her distracted heart, she set its sleeping face against her, closely, steadily against her, and sped onward to the river. To the rolling river, swift and dim, where winter night sat brooding like the last dark thoughts of many who had sought a refuge there before her, where scattered lights upon the banks gleamed sullen, red and dull, as torches that were burning there to show the way to death, where no abode of living people cast its shadow on the deep, impenetrable, melancholy shade. To the river, to that portal of eternity, her desperate footsteps tended with the swiftness of its rapid waters running to the sea. He tried to touch her as she passed him, going down to its dark level, but the wild, distempered form the fierce and terrible love, the desperation that had left all human check or hold behind, swept by him like the wind. He followed her. She paused a moment on the brink, before the dreadful plunge. He fell down on his knees and in a shriek addressed the figures of the bells now hovering above them. "'Have mercy on her!' he exclaimed as one in whom this dreadful crime has sprung from love perverted, from the strongest, deepest love we fallen creatures know. Think what her misery must have been when such seed bears such fruit. Heaven meant her to be good. There's no loving mother on the earth who might not come to this if such a life had gone before. Who oh, have mercy on my child, who oh, even at this pass means mercy to her own and dies herself, and perils her immortal soul to save it. She was in his arms. He held her now. His strength was like a giant's. He might have said more, but the bells, the old familiar bells, his own dear, constant, steady friends, the chimes, began to ring the joy peals for a new year, so lustily, so merrily, so happily, so gaily, that he leapt upon his feet, and broke the spell that bound him. "'And whatever you do, father,' said Meg, "'don't eat tripe again without asking some doctor whether it's likely to agree with you, for how you have been going on, good gracious!' She was working with her needle at the little table by the fire, dressing her simple gown with ribbons for her wedding so quietly happy, so blooming and youthful, so full of beautiful promise, that he uttered a great cry as if it were an angel in his house, then flew to clasp her in his arms. But he caught his feet in the newspaper which had fallen on the hearth, and somebody came rushing in between them. "'No!' cried the voice of the same somebody. A generous and jolly voice it was. "'Not even you! Not even you!' The first kiss of Meg in the new year is mine. Mine! I have been waiting outside the house this hour to hear the bells and claim it. Meg, my precious prize, a happy year, a life of happy years, my darling wife. And Richard smothered her with kisses. 
you never in all your life saw anything like Trotty after this. I don't care where you have lived or what you have seen. You never in all your life saw anything at all approaching him. He sat down in his chair and beat his knees and cried. He sat down in his chair and beat his knees and laughed. He sat down in his chair and beat his knees and laughed and cried together. He got out of his chair and hugged Meg. He got out of his chair and hugged Richard. He got out of his chair and hugged them both at once. He kept running up to Meg and squeezing her fresh face between his hands and kissing it, going from her backward not to lose sight of it, and running up again like a figure in a magic lantern. And whatever he did, he was constantly sitting himself down in this chair and never stopping in it for a single moment, being, that's the truth, beside himself with joy. "'And tomorrow's your wedding day, my pet!' cried Trotty. "'Your real happy wedding day!' "'Today!' cried Richard, shaking hands with him. "'Today! The chimes are ringing in the new year! Hear them!' They were ringing. Bless their sturdy hearts, they were ringing. Great bells as they were, melodious, deep-mouthed, noble bells, cast in no common metal, made by no common founder, when had they ever chimed like that before? "'But today, my pet,' said Trotty, "'you and Richard had some words today.' "'Because he's such a bad fellow, father,' said Meg. "'At you, Richard. Such a headstrong, violent man. He'd a made no more speaking his mind to that great alderman, and putting him down, oh, I don't know where, than he would of kissing Meg,' suggested Richard, doing it, too. "'No, not a bit more.' said Meg. But I wouldn't let him, father. Where would have been the use? Richard, my boy, cried Trotty, you was turned up trumps originally, and trumps you must be until you die. But you were crying by the fire tonight, my pet, when I came home. Why did you cry by the fire? I was thinking of the years we've passed together, father, only that, and thinking you might miss me and be lonely. Trotty was backing off to that extraordinary chair again, when the child, who had been awakened by the noise, came running in half-dressed. "'Why, here she is!' cried Trotty, catching her up. "'Here's little Lillian! Ha, ha, ha! Here we are, and here we go! Oh, here we are, and here we go again! And here we are, and here we go! And Uncle Will, too!' Stopping in his trot to greet him heartily. "'Oh, Uncle Will!' vision that I've had to-night, through lodging you. Oh, Uncle Will, the obligations that you've laid me under by your coming, my good friend!" Before Will Fern could make the least reply, a band of music burst into the room, attended by a flock of neighbours screaming, "'A happy new year, Meg! A happy wedding! Many of em! and other fragmentary good wishes of that sort. The drum, who was a private friend of Trotty's, then stepped forward and said, "'Trotty Vec, my boy, it's got about that your daughter is going to be married tomorrow. There ain't a soul that knows you don't wish you well, or that knows her and don't wish her well, or that knows you both and don't wish you both all the happiness a new year can bring. And here we are to play it in accordingly.' "'What a happiness it is, I'm sure,' said Trotty, "'to be so esteemed. How kind and neighbourly you are!' It's all along of my dear daughter. She deserves it." At this moment a combination of prodigious sounds was heard outside, and a good-humoured, comely woman of some fifty years of age, or thereabouts, came running in, closely followed by the marrow bones and cleavers and the bells. Not the bells, but a portable collection, on a frame. Trotty said, "'It's Mrs. Chickenstalker!' and sat down and beat his knees again. "'Married, and not tell me, Meg!' cried the good woman. "'Never! I couldn't rest on the last night of the old year without coming to wish you joy. I couldn't have done it, Meg, not if I'd been bedridden. So here I am!' "'Mrs. Tugby!' shouted Trotty, who had been going round and round her in an ecstasy. "'I should say, chicken stalker. "'Bless your rotten soul! A happy new year, and many of em, Mrs. Tugby!' said Trotty, when he had saluted her. "'I should say, chicken stalker, this is Wilfirm and Lillian!' The worthy dame, to his surprise, 
turned very pale and very red. "'Not Lillian Fern, whose mother died in Dorsetshire?' she said. Her uncle answered yes, and, meeting hastily, they exchanged some hurried words together, of which the upshot was that Mrs. Chickenstalker shook him by both hands, saluted Trotty on his cheek again of her own free will, and took the child to her capacious breast. "'Will Fern,' said Trotty, pulling off his right-hand muffler, "'not the friend that you was open to find?' "'Aye,' returned Will, putting a hand on each of Trotty's shoulders, "'and like to prove almost as good a friend, if that can be, as one I found.' "'Oh!' said Trotty. "'Please to play up there. Will you have the goodness?' Had Trotty dreamed, or are his joys and sorrows and the actors in them but a dream, himself a dream, the teller of this tale a dreamer, waking but now? If it be so, O listener, dear to him in all his visions, try to bear in mind the stern realities from which these shadows come, and in your sphere, none is too wide and none too limited for such an end, endeavour to correct improve and soften them. So may the new year be a happy one to you, happy to many more whose happiness depends on you. So may each year be happier than the last, and not the meanest of our brethren or sisterhood debarred from their rightful share in what our great Creator formed them to enjoy. End of section 15, fourth quarter, and end of the chimes. Section 16 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Billy's Santa Claus Experience Of course, I don't believe in any such person as Santa Claus, but Tommy does. Tommy is my little brother, aged six. Last Christmas I thought I'd make some fun for the young one by playing Santa Claus, but as always happens when I try to amuse anybody, I just got myself into trouble. I went to bed pretty early on Christmas Eve, so as to give my parents a chance to get the presents out of the closet in Mamma's room, where they had been locked up since they were bought. I kept my clothes on except my shoes, and put my nightgown over them so as I'd look white if any of them came near me. Then I waited, pinching myself to keep awake. After a while, Papa came into the room with a lot of things that he'd dumped on Tommy's bed. Then Mamma came in and put some things on mine, and in our two stockings that were hung up by the chimney. Then they both went out very quiet, and soon all the lights went out too. I kept on pinching myself and waiting for a time, and then when I was sure that everybody was asleep I got up. The first thing I went into was my sister's room and got her white fur rug that Mamma gave her on her birthday and her seal-skin cape that was hanging on the closet door. I tied the cape on my head with shoestrings, and it made a good big cap. Then I put the fur rug around me and pinned it with big safety pins, what I found on Tommy's garters. Then I got Mamma's new scrap basket, trimmed with roses, what Mrs. Simmons broidered for the church fair, and piled all of the kids' toys into it. I fastened it to my back with Papa's suspenders, and then I started for the roof. I hurt my fingers some opening the scuttle, but kept right on. It was snowing hard, and I stood and let myself get pretty well covered with flakes. Then I crawled over to the chimney that went down into our room, and climbed up on top of it. I had brought my bicycle lantern with me, and I lighted it so as Tommy could see me when I came down the chimney into the room. There did not seem to be any places inside the chimney where I could hold on by my feet, but the ceiling in our room was not very high, and I had often jumped most as far, so I just let her go, and I suppose I went down. 
anyway i did not know about anything for a long time then i woke up all in the dark with my head feeling queer and when i tried to turn over in bed i found i wasn't in bed at all and then my arms and legs began to hurt terrible mostly one arm that was doubled up i tried to get up but i couldn't because my bones hurt so and i was terrible cold and there was nothing to stand on i was just stuck then i began to cry and pretty soon i heard mamma's voice saying to papa those must be sparrows that are making that noise in the chimney just touch a match to the wood in the boy's fireplace i heard papa strike a light and then the wood began to crackle then by jinx it began to get hot and smoky and i screamed help murder put out that fire lest you want to burn me up then i heard papa stamping on the wood and mamma calling out where's billy where is my child next tommy woke up and began to cry and everything was terrible especially the pains all over me then papa called out very stern william if you are in that chimney come down at once and i answered crying that i would if i could but i was stuck and couldn't then i heard papa getting dressed and pretty soon he and john from the stable went up on the roof and let down ropes what i put around me and they hauled me up it was just daylight and i was all black and sooty and scratched and my arm was broken everybody scolded me except mamma i had spoiled my sister's white rug and broken all of tommy's toys and the snow what went in through the scuttle melted and marked the parlour ceiling besides i guess it cost papa a good deal to get my arm mended nobody would believe that i had just meant to make some fun for tommy and my arm and all my bruised places hurt me awful for a long time if i live to be a million i am never going to play santa claus again End of section 16section seventeen of a budget of christmas tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathy wright christmas in poganuck by harriet beecher stowe the first christmas can any of us look back to the earlier days of our mortal pilgrimage and remember the helpless sense of desolation and loneliness caused by being forced to go off to the stillness and darkness of a solitary bed far from all the beloved voices and employments and sights of life can we remember lying hearing distant voices and laughs of more fortunate older people and the opening and shutting of doors that told of scenes of animation and interest from which we were excluded how doleful sounded the tick of the clock and how dismal was the darkness as sunshine faded from the window leaving only a square of dusky dimness in place of daylight all who remember these will sympathize with dolly who was hustled off to bed by nabby the minute supper was over that she might have the decks clear for action now be a good girl shut your eyes and say your prayers and go right to sleep had been nabby's parting injunction as she went out closing the door after her the little head sunk into the pillow and dolly recited her usual liturgy of our father who art in heaven and i pray god to bless my dear father and mother and all my dear friends and relations and make me a good girl and ending with now i lay me down to sleep but sleep she could not the wide bright wistful blue eyes 
lay shining like two stars toward the fading light in the window and the little ears were strained to catch every sound she heard the shouts of tom and bill the loud barking of spring as they went out the door and the sound went to her heart spring her faithful attendant the most loving and sympathetic of dogs her friend and confidential counselor in many a solitary ramble spring had gone with the boys to see the sight and left her alone she began to pity herself and cry softly on her pillow for a while she could hear nabby's energetic movements below washing up dishes putting back chairs and giving energetic thumps and bangs here and there as her way was of producing order but by and by that was all over and she heard the loud shutting of the kitchen door and nabby's voice chatting with her attendant as she went off to the scene of gaiety in those simple innocent days of new england villages nobody thought of locking house doors at night there was in those times no idea either of tramps or burglars and many a night in summer had dolly lain awake and heard the voices of tree toads and whippoorwills mingling with the whisper of leaves and the swaying of m boughs while the great outside door of the house lay broad open in the moonlight but then this was when everybody was in the house and asleep when the door of her parents room stood open on the front hall and she knew she could run to the paternal bed in a minute for protection now however she knew the house was empty everybody had gone out of it and there was something fearful to a little lonely body in the possibilities of a great empty house she got up and opened her door and the tick-tock of the old kitchen clock for a moment seemed like company but pretty soon its ticking began to strike louder and louder with a nervous insistency on her ear till the nerves quivered and vibrated and she couldn't go to sleep she lay and listened to all the noises outside it was a still clear freezing night when the least sound clinked with a metallic resonance she heard the runners of sleighs squeaking and crunching over the frozen road and the lively jingle of bells they would come nearer nearer pass by the house and go off in the distance those were the happy folks going to see the gold star and the christmas greens in the church the gold star the christmas greens had all the more attraction from their vagueness dolly was fanciful little creature and the clear air and romantic scenery of a mountain town had fed her imagination stories she had never read except in the bible and the pilgrim's progress but her very soul had vibrated with the descriptions of the celestial city something vague bright glorious lying beyond some dark river and nabby's rude account of what was going on in the church suggested those images finally a bright thought popped into her head she could see the church from the front windows of the house she would go there and look in haste she sprang out of bed and dressed herself it was sharp and freezing in the fireless chamber but dolly's blood had a racing healthy tingle to it she didn't mind cold she wrapped her cloak around her and tied on her hood and ran to the front windows there it was to be sure the little church with its sharp pointed windows every pane of which was sending streams of light across the glittering snow there was a crowd around the door and men and boys looking in at the windows dolly's soul was fired but the m boughs a little obstructed her vision 
she thought she would go down and look at it from the yard. So downstairs she ran, but as she opened the door, the sound of the chant rolled out into the darkness with sweet and solemn cadence. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Dolly's soul was all aglow. Her nerves tingled and vibrated. She thought of the bells ringing in the celestial city. She could no longer contain herself, but faster and faster the little hooded form scudded across the snowy plain and pushed in among the dark clusters of spectators at the door. All made way for the child, and in a moment, whether in the body or out, she could not tell. Dolly was sitting in a little nook under a bower of spruce, gazing at the star and listening to the voices. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory, O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty. Her heart throbbed and beat. She trembled with a strange happiness, and as one entranced till the music was over. Then came reading, the rustle and murmur of people kneeling, and then they all rose, and there was the solemn buzz of voices repeating the creed with a curious, lulling sound to her ear. There was old Mr. Danforth, with his spectacles on, reading with a pompous tone, as if to witness a good confession for the church. And there was Squire Lewis, and old Ma'am Lewis, and there was one place where they all bowed their heads, and all the ladies made curtsies, all of which entertained her mightily. When the sermon began, Dolly got fast asleep, and slept as quietly as a pet lamb in a meadow lying in a little warm roll back under the shadows of the spruces. She was so tired and so sound asleep that she did not wake when the service ended, lying serenely curled up and having, perhaps, pleasant dreams. She might have had the fortunes of little Goody Two-Shoes, whose history was detailed in one of the few children's books then printed had not two friends united to find her out. Spring, who had got into the slips with the boys, and been an equally attentive and edified listener, after service began a tour of investigation, dog fashion, with his nose. For how could a minister's dog form a suitable judgment of any new procedure, if he was repressed from the use of his own leading faculty. So Spring went around the church, conscientiously smelling at pew doors, smelling of the greens, smelling at the heels of gentlemen and ladies, till he came near the door of the church, when he suddenly smelt something which called for immediate attention and he made a side dart into the thicket where Dolly was sleeping, and began licking her face and hands, and pulling her dress, giving short barks occasionally, as if to say, Come, Dolly, wake up! At the same instant, Hyl, who had seen her from the gallery, came down just as the little one was sitting up with a dazed, bewildered air. Why, Dolly! How come you out of bed this time of night? Don't you know? The nine o'clock bells just rang. Dolly knew Hyl well enough. What child in the village did not? She reached up her little hands, saying in an apologetic fashion, They were all gone away, and I was so lonesome. Hyle took her up in his long arms and carried her home and was just entering the house door with her, as the sleigh drove up with Parson Cushing and his wife. "'Well, Parsons, your folks has all been to the illumination. Nabby, and Bill, and Tom, and Dolly here. 
found her all rolled up in a heap like a rabbit under the cedars why dolly cushing exclaimed her mother what upon earth got you out of bed this time of night you'll catch your death of cold i was all alone said dolly with a piteous bleat oh there there wife don't say a word put in the parson get her off to bed never mind dolly don't you cry for parson cushing was a soft-hearted gentleman and couldn't bear the sight of dolly's quivering underlip so dolly told her little story how she had been promised a sugar dog by nabby if she'd be a good girl and go to sleep and how she couldn't go to sleep and how she just went down to look from the yard and how the music drew her right over there there said parson cushing go to bed dolly and if nabby don't give you a sugar dog i will this christmas dressing is all nonsense he added but the child's not to blame it was natural after all he said to his wife the last thing after they were settled for the night our little dolly is an unusual child there were not many little girls that would have dared to do that i shall preach a sermon right away that will set all this christmas matter straight said the doctor there is not a shadow of evidence that the first christians kept christmas it wasn't kept for the first three centuries nor was christ born anywhere near the twenty-fifth of december the next morning found little dolly's blue eyes wide open with all the wondering eagerness of a new idea dolly had her wise thoughts about christmas she had been terribly frightened at first when she was brought home from the church but when her papa kissed her and promised her a sugar dog she was quite sure that whatever the unexplained mystery might be he did not think the lovely scene of the night before a wicked one and when mrs cushing came and covered the little girl up warmly in bed she only said to her dolly you must never get out of bed again at night after you are put there you might have caught a dreadful cold and been sick and died and then we should have lost our little dolly so dolly promised readily to be good and lie still ever after no matter what attractions might be on foot in the community much was gained however and it was all clear again and forthwith the little fanciful head proceeded to make the most of it thinking over every feature of the wonder the child had a vibrating musical organization and the sway and rush of the chanting still sounded in her ears and reminded her of that wonderful story in the pilgrim's progress where the gate of the celestial city swung open and there were voices that sung blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him who sitteth on the throne and then that wonderful star that shone just as if it were a real star how could it be for miss ida lewis being a young lady of native artistic genius had cut a little hole in the centre of her gilt paper star behind which was placed a candle so that it gave real light in a way most astonishing to untaught eyes in dolly's simple view it verged on the supernatural perhaps it was the very real star read about in the gospel story why not dolly was at the happy age when anything bright and heavenly seemed credible and had the child faith to which all things were possible i wish my dear said mrs cushing after they were retired to their room for the night that to-morrow morning you would read the account of the birth of christ in st matthew 
and give the children some advice upon the proper way of keeping Christmas. Well, but you know we don't keep Christmas. Nobody knows anything about Christmas, said the doctor. You know what I mean, my dear, replied his wife. You know that my mother and her family do keep Christmas. I always heard of it when I was a child, and even now, though I have been out of the way of it so long, I cannot help a sort of kindly feeling toward these ways. I am not surprised at all that the children got drawn over last night to the service. I think it's the most natural thing in the world, and I know by experience just how attractive such things are. I shouldn't wonder if this other church should draw very seriously on your congregation. But I don't want it to begin by taking away our own children. Dolly is an inquisitive child, a child that thinks a good deal, and she'll be asking all sorts of questions about the why and wherefore of what she saw last night. Oh, yes, Dolly is a bright one. Dolly's an uncommon child, said the doctor, who had a pardonable pride in his children, they being, in fact, the only worldly treasure that he was at all rich in. He rose up early on the following Sabbath, and proceeded to buy a sugar-dog at the store of Lucius Jenks, and when Dolly came down to breakfast, he called her to him and presented it, saying, as he kissed her, Papa gives you this, not because it is Christmas, but because he loves his Dolly. But isn't it Christmas? asked Dolly with a puzzled air. No, child, nobody knows when Christ was born, and there is nothing in the Bible to tell us when to keep Christmas. And then in family worship, the doctor read the account of the birth of Christ, and of the shepherds abiding in the fields, who came at the call of the angels, and they sung the old hymn, while shepherds watched their flocks by night. Now, children, he said when all was over, you must be good children and go to school. If we are going to keep any day on account of the birth of Christ, the best way to keep it is by doing all our duties on that day better than any other. Your duty is to be good children, go to school, and mind your lessons. Tom and Bill were quite ready to fall in with their father's view of the matter. As for Dolly, she put her little tongue advisedly to the back of her sugar dog, and found that he was very sweet indeed, a most tempting little animal. She even went so far as to nibble off a bit of the green ground he stood on, yet resolved heroically not to eat him at once, but to make him last as long as possible. She wrapped him tenderly in cotton, and took him to the school with her, and when her confidential friend Bessie Lewis displayed her Christmas gifts, Dolly had something on her side to show, though she shook her curly head and informed Bessie in strict confidence that there wasn't any such thing as Christmas. Her papa had told her so, a heresy which Bessie forthwith reported when she went home at noon. Poor little child! And did she say so? asked gentle old Grandmama Lewis. Well, dear, you mustn't blame her. She don't know any better. You bring the little one in here tonight, and I'll give her a Christmas cookie. I'm sorry for such children. And so, after school, Dolly went in to see dear old Madame Lewis, who sat in her rocking chair in the front parlor, where the fire was snapping behind great tall brass andirons, and all the pictures 
were overshadowed with boughs of spruce and pine. Dolly gazed about her with awe and wonder. Over one of the pictures was suspended a cross of green with flowers of white everlasting. "'What is that for?' asked Dolly, pointing solemnly with her little forefinger and speaking under her breath. "'Dear child, that is the picture of my poor boy who died ever so many years ago. That is my cross. We have all one to carry. Dolly did not half understand these words, but she saw tears in the gentle old lady's eyes and was afraid to ask more. She accepted thankfully, and with her nicest and best executed courtesy, a Christmas cookie representing a good-sized fish, with fins all spread and pink sugar plums for eyes, and went home marveling yet more about this mystery of Christmas. As she was crossing the green to go home, the Poganuck stage drove in, with Hyle seated on high, whipping up his horses to make them execute the grand entree, which was the glory of his daily existence. Now that the stage was on runners, and slipped noiselessly over the smooth frozen plain, Heil cracked his whip more energetically and shouted louder, first to one horse, then to another, to make up for the loss of the rattling wheels. And he generally had the satisfaction of seeing all the women rushing distractedly to the doors and windows, and imagined them saying, There is Heil! The stage is in! "'Hello, Dolly!' he called out, drawing up with a suddenness which threw the four horses back upon their haunches. "'I've got a bundle for your folks. Want a ride? You may just jump up here by me, and I'll take you round to your father's door.' And so Dolly reached up her little red-mittened hand, and Hyle drew her up beside him. "'Expect ye want a bit of a ride?' and i got a bundle for widow badger down on south street so i guess i'll go round that way to make it longer i expect this ere bundle is from some of your mall folks in boston piscopals they be and keeps christmas good sized bundle tis reckon it'll come handy in a good many ways so after finishing his detour Heil landed his little charge at the parsonage door. "'Reckon I'll be over when I put up my horses,' said he to Nabby, when he handed down the bundle to her. "'I hain't been to see you much lately, Nabby, and I know you been a-pinin' after me, but fact is—' "'Well, now, Heil Jones, you just shut up your little imperence,' said Nabby, with flashing eyes. You just look out, or you'll get something. I expect to get a kiss when I come around tonight, said Heil composedly. Take care of that air bundle now. Maybe there's glass or crockery in it. Heil Jones, said Nabby, don't give me none of your sass, for I won't take it. Jim saw and said last night you was the brassiest man he ever see. He said there was brass enough in your face to make a kettle of. You tell him there's sap enough in his head to fill it anyway, said Hyle. Goodbye, Nabby. I'll come round this evening. And he drove away at a rattling pace, while Nabby, with flushed cheeks and snapping eyes, soliloquized. Well, I hope he will come. I just like a chance to show him how little I care for him. Meanwhile, the bundle was soon opened and contained a store of treasures. A smart little red dress and a pair of red shoes for Dolly. A half dozen pocket handkerchiefs for Dr. Cushing and Robinson Crusoe and Sanford and Merton handsomely bound for the boys and a bonnet trimming for Mrs. Cushing. 
These were accompanied by a characteristic letter from Aunt Debbie Kittery, opening as follows. Dear Sister, Mother worries because she thinks you won't get any Christmas presents. However, this comes to give every one of you some of the crumbs which fall from the church's table. And Mother says she wishes you all a pious Christmas, which she thinks is better than a merry one. If I didn't lay violent hands on her, she would use all her substance in riotous giving of Christmas presents to all the beggars and chimney-sweeps in Boston. She is in good health, and talks daily of wanting to see you and the children, and I hope before long you will bring some of them and come and make us a visit. Your affectionate sister, Debbie Kittery. There was a scene of exultation and clamor in the parsonage as these presents were pulled out and discussed, and when all possible joy was procured from them in the sitting-room, the children rushed in a body into the kitchen and showed them to Nabby, calling on her to join their acclamations. On the whole, when Dolly had said her prayers that night and thought the matter over, she concluded that her Christmas day had been quite a success. THE SECOND CHRISTMAS Once more had Christmas come round in Poganuck. Once more the Episcopal Church was being dressed with ground pine and spruce. But this year economy begun to make its claim felt. An illumination might do very well to open a church, but there were many who said, To what purpose is this waste, when the proposition was made to renew it yearly? Consequently, it was resolved to hold the Christmas Eve service with only that necessary amount of light which would enable the worshippers to read the prayers. On this Christmas Eve, Dolly went to bed at her usual hour with a resigned and quiet spirit. She felt herself a year older and more than a year wiser than when Christmas had dawned upon her consciousness. Miss Persis appeared on the ground by day dawn. A great kettle was slung over the kitchen fire, in which cakes of tallow were speedily liquefying. A frame was placed quite across the kitchen to sustain candle-rods, with a train of boards underneath to catch the drippings. And Miss Persis, with a brow like one of the fates, announced, "'Now we can't have any young uns in this kitchen today." and Dolly saw there was no getting any attention in that quarter. Miss Persis, in a gracious Saturday afternoon mood, sitting in her own tent door, dispensing hospitalities and cookies, was one thing. But Miss Persis in her armor, with her loins girded with a hard day's work to be conquered, was quite another she was terrible as minerva with her helmet on dinner baskets for all the children were hastily packed and they were sent off to school with the injunction on no account to show their faces about the premises till night the doctor warned of what was going on retreated to his study at the top of the house where serenely above the lower cares of earth he sailed off into president edward's treatise on the nature of true virtue concerning which he was preparing a paper to read at the next association meeting that candles were a necessity of life he was well convinced and by faith he dimly accepted the fact that one day in the year the whole house was to be devoted and given up to this manufacture and his part of the business as he understood it was clearly to keep himself out of the way till it was over there won't be much of a dinner at home anyway said nabby to dolly as she packed her basket with an extra doughnut or two 
I've got to go to church today, cause I'm one of the singers, and your ma'll be busy waiting on her. So we shall just have a pick-up dinner, and you be sure not to come home till night. By that time, it'll be all over. Dolly trotted off to school, well content with the prospect before her. A nooning with leave to play with the girls at school was not an unpleasant idea. But the first thing that saluted her on her arrival was that Bessie Lewis, her own dear particular Bessie, was going to have a Christmas party at her house that afternoon, and was around distributing invitations right and left among the scholars with a generous freedom. We are going to have nuts, and raisins, and cakes, and mottoes, said Bessie with artless triumph. The news of this bill of fare spread like wildfire through the school. Never had a party been heard of which contemplated such a liberal entertainment, for the rising generation of Poganuck were by no means wearied with indulgence, and raisins and almonds stood for grandeur with them. But these mottoes, which consisted of bits of confectionery wrapped up in printed couplets of sentimental poetry, were an unheard-of refinement. Bessie assured them that her papa had sent clear to Boston for them, and whoever got one would have his or her fortune told by it. The school was a small select one, comprising the children of all ages from the best families of Poganuck, Both boys and girls, and all with great impartiality, had been invited. Miss Titcomb, the teacher, quite readily promised to dismiss at three o'clock that afternoon any scholar who should bring a permission from parents, and the children nothing doubted that such a permission was obtainable. Dolly alone saw a cloud in the horizon. She had been sent away with strict injunctions not to return till evening, and children in those days never presumed to make any exceptions in obeying an absolute command of their parents. "'But of course you'll go home at noon and ask your mother, and of course she'll let you, won't she, girls?' said Bessie. "'Oh, certainly, of course she will,' said all the older girls. "'Because you know a party is a thing that don't happen every day, "'and your mother would think it strange if you didn't come and ask her.' "'So too thought Miss Titcomb, a most exemplary, precise, and proper young lady, "'who always moved and spoke and thought as become a schoolmistress, "'so that, although she was in reality only twenty years old, Dolly considered her as very advanced and ancient person, if anything a little older than her father and mother. Even she was of opinion that Dolly might properly go home to lay a case of such importance before her mother. And so Dolly rushed home after the morning school was over, running with all her might, and increasing in mental excitement as she ran. Her bonnet blew off upon her shoulders, her curls flew behind her in the wind, and she most inconsiderately used up the little stock of breath that she would want to set her cause in order before her mother. Just here we must beg any mother and housekeeper to imagine herself in the very midst of the most delicate, perplexing, and laborious of household tasks when interruption is most irksome and perilous, suddenly called to discuss with a child some new and startling proposition, to which at the moment she cannot even give a thought. Mrs. Cushing was sitting in the kitchen with Miss Persis, by the side of a cauldron of melted tallow, kept in a fluid state by the heat of a portable furnace on which it stood. 
a long train of half-dipped candles hung like so many stalactites from the frames on which the rods rested and the two were patiently dipping set after set and replacing them again on the frame as sure as i'm alive if there isn't dolly cushion coming back running and tearing like a wild creeter said miss persis she'll be here in a minute and knock everything down mrs cushing looked and with quick movement stepped to the door dolly what are you here for didn't i tell you not to come home this noon oh mamma there's going to be a party at general lewis's bessie's party and the girls are all going mayn't i go no you can't it's impossible said her mother your best dress isn't ready to wear and there's nobody can spend time to get you ready go right back to school but mamma go said her mother in the decisive tone that mothers used in the old days when arguing with children was not a possibility what's this all about asked the doctor looking out of the door why said mrs cushing there's going to be a party at general lewis's and dolly is wild to go it's just impossible for me to attend to her now oh i don't want her intimate at lewis's said the doctor and immediately he came out behind his wife there run away to school dolly he said don't trouble your mother you don't want to go to parties why it's foolish to think of it run away now and don't think any more about it there's a good girl dolly turned and went back to school the tears freezing on her cheek as she went as for not thinking any more about it that was impossible when three o'clock came scholar after scholar rose and departed until at last dolly was the only one remaining in the schoolroom when dolly came home that night the coast was clear and the candles were finished and put away to harden in a freezing cold room the kitchen was once more restored and nabby bustled about getting supper as if nothing had happened i really feel sorry about poor dolly said mrs cushing to her husband do you think she cared much asked the doctor looking as if a new possibility had struck his mind yes indeed poor child she went away crying but what could i do about it i couldn't stop to dress her wife we must take her somewhere to make up for it said the doctor just then the stage stopped at the door and a bundle from boston was handed in dolly's tears were soon wiped and dried and her mourning was turned into joy when a large jointed london doll emerged from the bundle the christmas gift of her grandmother in boston dolly's former darling was old and shabby but this was of twice the size with cheeks exhibiting a state of the most florid health besides this there was as usual in grandma's christmas bundle something for every member of the family and so the evening went on festive wings poor little dolly only that afternoon she had watered with her tears at school the dismal long straight seam which stretched on before her as life sometimes does to us bare disagreeable and cheerless she had come home crying little dreaming of the joy just approaching but before bedtime no cricket in the hearth was cheerier or more noisy she took the new dolly to bed with her and could hardly sleep for the excitement of her company meanwhile hyle had brought the doctor a message to the following effect i was driving by mr tim hawkins and Miss hawkins she comes out and says they're going to have an apple cutting there tomorrow night and she would like to have you and miss cushion 
and all your folks come nabby and all the doctor and his lady of course assented well then doctor if it's all one to you continued hyle i'd like to take you over in my new double sleigh i've just got two new strings of bells up from boston and i think we'll sort of make the snow fly s'pose there'd be no objection to taking my mother along with ye oh hyle we shall be delighted to go in company with your mother and we're ever so obliged to you said mrs cushing well i'll be round by six o'clock said hyle then wife said the doctor we'll take dolly and make up for the loss of her party punctually at six hyle's two horses with all their bells jingling stood at the door of the parsonage whence tom and bill who had been waiting with caps and mittens on for the last half hour burst forth with irrepressible shouts of welcome take care now boys don't haul them buffalo skins out on the snow said hyle don't get things in a must gently wait for your ma and the doctor got to stow the grown folks in fust boys can hang on anywhere and so first came mrs cushing and the doctor and were installed on the back seat with dolly in between then hot bricks were handed in to keep feet warm and the buffalo robe was tucked down securely then nabby took her seat by hyle in front and the sleigh drove round for old mrs jones the doctor insisted on giving up his place to her and tucking her warmly under the buffalo robe while he took the middle seat and acted as moderator between the boys who were in a wild state of hilarity spring with explosive barks raced first on this and then on that side of the sleigh as it flew swiftly over the smooth frozen road the stars blinked white and clear out of a deep blue sky and the path wounded uphill among the cedars and junipers and clumps of mountain laurel on whose broad green leaves the tufts of snow lay like clusters of white roses the keen clean air was full of stimulus and vigor and so hyle's proposition to take the longest way met with enthusiastic welcome from all the party next to being a bird and having wings is the sensation of being borne over the snow by a pair of spirited horses who enjoy the race apparently as much as those they draw though hyle contrived to make the ride about eight miles it yet seemed but a short time before the party drove up to the great red farmhouse whose lighted windows sent streams of radiant welcome far out into the night our little dolly had had an evening of unmixed bliss everybody had petted her and talked to her and been delighted with her sayings and doings and she was carrying home a paper parcel of sweet things which good mrs hawkins had forced into her hand at parting she had spent a really happy christmas end of section seventeen christmas in poganuck